We are living in a time of Farmageddon. Farmageddon is the prospect of a world where medication seems to cause more harm than good. And after 25 years out there looking at patients' medication lists and trying to sort out the good from the bad, I hate to tell you, it's here. I'd like you to meet my friend Nancy. Now, Nancy is the 75-year-old mother of a good friend. Um, very vibrant woman, loves to dance, you know, really has an active life despite her arthritis, hypertension, and other diseases. So I hadn't seen her in a while, and I get a call from her about three weeks ago. Actually, it's a voicemail. And this is the voicemail she leaves me. Lori, you need to come and see me. I'm in the hospital. I need you to look at my medications because they're going to discharge me tomorrow, and these idiots have no idea what's wrong with me. And I've been here twice in the last month. OK, when Nancy calls, go. <laughs> and so I um, went to see her and discovered a staggering thing. She was taking 16 different medications prescribed by five different doctors. Five of the medications she had been given were medications on a do not use list for people over the age of 65 because they're so toxic. We don't like to use those medications anymore. One of the medications was the exact reason she had been hospitalized twice in the last month. So we figured that out. I talked to her doctor, I talked to Nancy, and afterwards she says to me, Laurie, why on earth did my doctor not figure this out? Well, you know, I don't have a good answer for Nancy, and I don't have a good answer for most of the people that ask me that question. All I can say is it's complicated, and it's not a great answer. It's particularly not a great answer for the many people that suffer from adverse drug effects every year. In fact, in 2011, it was calculated that adverse drug effects killed enough people to make it the fourth leading cause of death. That was more than the people who died from Alzheimer's disease, diabetes, and accidents that year. So this is a very deadly issue. It's a very common issue. In the same year, 2.1 million different adverse events were reported to our Food and Drug Administration. So you know, this is a widespread problem, and it's one that has a great deal of cost, both in human suffering and also in dollars. So what can we do about it? You see a picture here. This, to me, epitomizes what's going on in the whole world of drug prescribing today. We have a safety net. We have several safety nets that are built into the system. But a lot of times, they don't work really well. And the people that are falling through the net are generally those over the age of 65, because they don't have as much what we call physiologic reserve. That is, their bodies don't break down medications as well as they used to. They take a lot more, more medications than younger people. And on average, they visit hospitals a lot more often. 40% of the people over the age of 65 last year reported taking five or more medications. That's staggering. Do you know what the number was when I graduated from my graduate school program? It was only about 14% of the population. That's the kind of thing we're looking at. And it has a lot to do with the increase in medications that have been introduced into the market, but it also has a lot to do with things that aren't happening in the system that need to. Rather than stand here and lament about our healthcare system that's not taking care of us, what I propose to do is talk to you about some of my thoughts about how we as patients can actually plug up some of these holes in the safety net. The first thing I'd like to talk to you about is how did Nancy end up taking 16 medications on a daily basis. Some people would say that's a meal. What often happens is that not only do we have patients asking for medications, you know, the direct-to-consumer advertising we all see at night on television. We have a lot more drugs marketed than ever before. But then there's this other issue that kind of creeps up. And the reason I want to talk about it, instead of some of the other very important things that we really need to talk about when we discuss this issue, is this is something that you 
you as a patient, I can do something about. And so this is called the prescribing cascade, and this is how it goes. We're gonna take Nancy for an example. Nancy had some back pain because actually she had fallen in the garden a few days before this last hospital admission. So she started taking a sleeping pill because she had so much pain she couldn't sleep. So she falls again. She has more pain. Now she calls her doctor and he orders a medication called a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug, Advil. We can buy it over the counter. About three or four days later, her blood pressure starts going up and incidentally, she had an appointment with her primary care doc that day and he measured her blood pressure and said, wow, your blood pressure's high. I need to you know, bring that down a little bit. He starts her on a water pill, a diuretic, to decrease the fluid in her system. Well, do you know that falls are a side effect of sedating medications and then also increased blood pressure is a side effect of non anti-inflammatory drugs. And so you see how this goes, right? This is exactly how people end up on 16 different medications a day, or maybe more. The key to getting past this is actually stopping it where it starts, recognizing that it, there's a side effect going on, not another medical condition. So I really want to get into some of the things that I believe that are important for us to be doing as patients to take care of ourselves. And I'd like to start off with this great quote. And this is by Le Leonard Kish. Actually, he ended up getting the um, Innovator of the Year Award for this quote from Forbes a couple years ago. It's been on my desk for the last three years. If, and fill in the blank, patient engagement were a drug, it would be the blockbuster drug of the century and malpractice not to use it. Now, what was he talking about? In this case, he was talking about the fact that patients actively engaging in their care in a cardiac health program were able to lower their risk of heart attacks so dramatically that it outpaced what we could do by giving people expensive anti-cholesterol drugs. Wow, people doing things for themselves about their health instead of taking a drug. Powerful patient engagement. Now, you know, we have talked about consumer-driven healthcare and patient-centered care in, in the world of healthcare for probably about the last 10 years. And we're really serious about it now, okay? We're trying to bring patients into the fold. We're trying to get them involved in the decisions they need to be making about their own health. We're doing that in many parts of medicine. But in the prescribing realm, we don't do it very well, and we don't do it very much. So here are some of my thoughts about what we might think about doing for ourselves. And this isn't hard. There are actually only three things. Number one is make a list. Make a list of all of your medications that you're taking and the dates that those medications were started. Why the dates? Because if I'm the person who's trying to figure out what's going on with you, and there might be prescribing cascade going on, those dates will clue me into how things were added to your drug list. And that might help me figure this out pretty quickly. Now, in addition, put your current and past medical conditions, any allergies to medication, and some notes about drugs that you might have been given but didn't tolerate. All of those things on that list can be very important clues to those who are taking care of you and prescribing more medication. By having that information, that might make the difference between you getting a drug that actually works for you or one that puts you in the hospital. So make the list. The other thing you need to do with the list, and this is where Nancy failed to act, is she made her list. She took it to each of her five different doctors and gave it to them. They looked at her list, they entered it in her chart, and that was it. The next thing you need to do with that list is you need to request that we review your medications, at least on an annual basis. More often, if you take more than five drugs a day, what that does is it forces us, physicians, pharmacists, to sit down with you and say, do I still need this medication? Does my health still require it? 
Could it be causing me problems? That's an active process, medication review, and we need to be doing it routinely. Now, if you have a hospital visit, if your health markedly improves or it deteriorates, those are other times that we really need to be reviewing the medications we take because a lot of times we may not need them anymore or we may need different doses. Having this kind of maintenance attitude towards our medications can help keep us out of the hospital. The second thing is that you need to be paranoid. Okay, you're hearing it from me, be paranoid. Be very paranoid about any new symptoms that occur after you start taking a new drug. Because I'll tell you, it's highly likely in many cases, particularly if you're over the age of 65, that those symptoms may be a side effect, okay? You may not need another drug, you just may need a different drug or no drug. So very important to keep a healthy sense of paranoia. And lastly, what we need to do is we need to ask questions. And I cannot emphasize this enough. I know that many of us want to be good patients. We want our healthcare providers to like us. We're afraid if we ask too many questions, they won't like us, or they will they'll fire us as a patient. What I'd like to tell you is that most good healthcare professionals welcome your questions, even though they're very time pressed, because you know what their questions say to them? It says, I really am concerned about my health. I'm a patient that you need to pay attention to. I'm gonna work with you. It's important to foster that partnership. That's what those questions do. So say you're getting a new medication. There are things that we need to do. And the first one is to stop, sit back, and think about a series of questions, which I highly recommend that you ask and are a part of the minimum information that the World Health Organization says that we should be getting from our doctors every time a new medication is prescribed. And so it's simple. Why, what, when, how, okay? Why, why do I need this medication now? What are the alternatives to taking this medication? Can I exercise more, eat a different diet, you know, take some vitamins? You know, many of us don't like to take medications. So what are my options? What will happen if I decide not to take this medication at all? It's an option, you know. You need to know what the outcome could be. What are the three most frequent side effects and serious side effects that I need to watch for? And what drugs on my medication list could this drug interact with? So those are your what questions. When? When will I know this drug is working? And if it's not working, what do you want me to do? Should I call you? Should I go to the emergency room? I mean, what kind of action should I take? When might I see side effects? Important also, with many medications, you're gonna see a few side effects first. They are usually, they can be very mild, but then they clear up. Is that gonna be the case for this drug? How? How do you want me to take this drug? I usually take my pills in a handful every morning with a large gulp of grape Gatorade. Is that okay? Sometimes it's not, believe me. So you wanna know that, right? How long do I need to take this medication? Taking medications past the duration that they should be taken is one of the biggest reasons right now for adverse drug effects that actually come from a very popular sleeping drug called Zolpidem, the brand name's Ambien. Probably causes more adverse drug effects that end up in ER visits than any other medication right now. And much of this is because that people are taking this drug for very long periods of time. It's only really supposed to be taken for about three months. So how long do I need to stay on this drug? Very good question. So I've just gave, given you some homework. You know, you're probably dreading now going into the doctor's office because now you're gonna have to take a notebook, right? You're gonna have to start talking 
to your healthcare provider. And you're going to be writing down some of those answers. You know, it's interesting, I was reading a paper about, you know, involving patients in the prescribing process. It's one of the only papers out there. And they were recording some of the comments they got from patients, and one of them was, well, gee, after you told me all of this, I realized what a responsibility it is to take medication. It's a lot of work. And you know, that person's right. But what do we normally do in many cases as patients? We come into a physician's office, 75% of all physicians' visits end with a prescription, and there are about 15-minute long visits. We take our prescription, we go home, we go to the pharmacy, fill it, and then, okay, we take our medicine, and we wait. Hopefully we feel better, sometimes we don't. This is an active role that I'm talking about. And the option for not doing it is this, okay? May not be now, may not be for a couple of years, but believe me, enough of us in this audience will experience this outcome that will think that it really would have been better had I taken that time up front. So finally, um, I have talked about something that is some extra work for us as patients, but I truly believe that it's one of the most important things that we can do at this point. You know, we need, as patients, to not wait for the invitation to the party, but to change the conversations that are happening in our doctor's offices. Because if we don't change the conversation, it's going to be quite a while before things actually start changing. And before they do, there might be a lot of bad outcomes along the way. So we need to step up as patients and do that. We need to take the role as co-creator of our health in combination with our healthcare provider and go forward with that. It's one of the most important things that you can do for yourself and for the people who care about you. And in the end, to me, it's the only way we can really live healthier. And why are we doing healthcare anyway? It's to enjoy our lives, right? Thank you.